I know he's an elder, and y'all appointed him for that, along with the other elders, and and uh, I just appreciate that so much. I can't tell you how much. I talked to him yesterday. I got off the phone. I told him this. I said, you know, just to talk with him after he came so close to the edge of leaving here. We've all got to leave here. I've got mixed emotions. I'm, I'm having a pretty good time down here. And uh, someone told me, I hope you have a good time going to here doing this. I said, I have a good time wherever I go. I try to. And uh, there are little things that come up. There are rocks in your shoes. Like this morning, I got up and I, I have on <clears throat> my son's shoes. My wife bought me a pair of 13s. Uh, shoes, and they happen to be exactly like these from when my son was like 15. And so I grabbed them, they're size 10. I got, I got some very disappointed little piggies in both, both of these shoes. So little things come up, then all you can do is laugh about it and go on. Uh, and that's what I try to do, but all of us are going to pass from this life, and what we've got to do is we've got to make the best of it while we're here, try to do as much good as we can. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn with to Matthew chapter 28, <clears throat> I want to see if a passage is still there. Uh, this is Bible class, so what I'm going to do is get someone to read this passage for me. Um, I love the computers when they work. I appreciate so much John getting this thing set up. Uh, this is the first time we've ever gotten it to work. The first congregation I took it to, it would put some slides upside down, some slides sideways. Then I appreciate my wife for finding whatever program it was that we needed to load into our new computer here. The other one got struck by lightning while I was down at camp one time. Uh, and uh, so we got it going. Then last week, it wouldn't work at all for some reason. And John, I'm going to have to take John. Where is John? Oh, well, John, wherever you are, buddy, we're gonna, I'm going to take you with me to, to, uh, to get, keep my computer going. Someone read Matthew chapter 28, 18, 19, and 20 for me. Terry, you feel like reading that, brother? Wow, you know, it's still there. That passage is still there. In fact, it, it hadn't changed at all. Same message, same thought. And to hear some congregations talk, and some preachers even, and some elders, things have changed. But that Great Commission is still there. We're going to talk more about that. Let me give you a little brief report of some of the things that are going on at camp. Now, these are just some slides of... Uh, shooting up here about our work, not only at Backwoods, a couple of slides from Backwoods. I found out I can't do 50, no, 80, I think. The first time I ever did a slide a presentation, I did 80 slides. John Rice cannot do 80 slides. <laughs> it, it'll just take way too long. Then I, I can't say I've, uh, I've fixed this problem, but I'm working on keeping my lessons a little more uh, timely. Uh, you know, some time ago, I decided to get to congregations 30 minutes early. And after today, getting everything set up, I might need to say 45 minutes. But uh, I, I did that about eight or ten years ago, and it's been a great blessing in my life. And I feel like I may get more people to stay awake and to listen to the lesson if I'll keep my sermons a little more timely. I have been known to go a little bit over. I was so thrilled last week, I preached 33 minutes. I thought that was really good for me, only to find out that they had uh, things had been delayed. The service didn't get started until 25, 20 after, and it was supposed to stop at 30. I only had uh, nine or ten minutes to preach my sermon, and I thought it went to, to 12, but their service ends at 1130, uh, starts at nine, uh, at 10, and ends at 1130. Uh, that, it doesn't take much preaching to please those people. <laughs> but the, the truth is, I, I still felt a little confused when I got done, and they said, really, the service is supposed to end at 1130, and I thought, oh my goodness, somebody's going to think I preached 55 minutes. But uh, uh, I'm going to try to work on that. But let me give you a little report on some of our work. I've Got these slides, so they'll just they'll just flick by, and you can look at them. I like to look into the eyes of the of the children. I know we have a lot of light coming in here, so you may have to squint your eyes just a little bit to see them. But thank you for your involvement in our work for about the last year, and uh, I guess uh, about a half. Uh, and uh, the uh, the work has gone very well. We now have camps, uh, two camps in uh, Tanzania. We have five camps in Cambodia. We have a camp in uh, in uh, uh, Guyana, uh, English speaking Guyana. Uh, we have uh, camp at Backwoods, of course. That's our number one, I guess you would say, mission work. We've got mission work to do with young people, hadn't we, in America. 
Our young people need it. It's uh, shocking to me from the time that I was a boy until now some of the things that our young people have to see and hear and do and how they're inundated with evolution and immorality and, and uh, terrible songs. You know, I remember when the radio stations wouldn't play a song uh, if it had a song in it with uh, one or two words in it that were not good. And now it's like they're going to make you listen to them. Uh, you know, I drove by a fella, stopped at a red light, and I, I felt like yelling, turn the radio off, man. I, don't, I shouldn't be forced to listen to that while I'm waiting at a red light. And, and then our young people have to hear that. And somebody says, well, they don't have to. They can turn it off. But they're young people. They're going to, they're gonna, a lot of them are going to say, hey, I'm curious. You know, if I, if I said to you, over there's a dead cat. I used to do this all the time to my kids. I'd say, is that a rabbit? When they'd turn their head, I'd steal their french fries. You know, we're, we're all distracted, aren't we? And uh, so we need uh, mission work here. We're also involved with the camp at uh, Polishing the Pulpit. I think, I get whether my son, my son directed that one, uh, backwoods-oriented uh, type uh, camp. I think we had, uh, I think he said uh, 156, I believe he said he had this year. That's a pretty good-sized camp. And uh, so we're very pleased with, with all those activities. In Cambodia this year, we had over 1,200 campers, including our day camps. Uh, at the big camp, we had 350. Now, by the way, that's down a little bit from the year before. Uh, they changed the date just a little bit, said it'd be better for them. And then when we got there, they said, whoops, they ran school a little bit longer. So this year, we're going to move it into September, so we'll make sure we won't have that conflict. And I'm expecting 450 for the camp this year. Uh, so pray for us about that work. Uh, then we had camps in uh, Simrip and uh, Lindai. Uh, in another town or two that I can't remember the name of, uh, I can't pronounce the name of, uh, but it is a wonderful thing to be over there in Cambodia. The humility of those children is just unbelievable. You'll give them a piece of bread. Sometimes we play Bible games, the little Bible games. We'll ask questions after we have our uh, reading of a study of a parable, and we'll do a Bible game, and the children raise their hand, the one that answers it gets a little piece of bread about that long. It reminds me of the bread that they talk about in the Bible because it comes in little pones. It looks like maybe like a, a, a one of these sandwich shop loaves of bread. And they have them on the side of the road stacked up like firewood right out there for the dust and the bugs and the bird droppings and everything on them. That's why often when I eat that bread, I eat the inside of the bread. I'm, I try to be kind of careful <laughs> about it. And... Uh, but anyway, you'll, they'll slice it in half or in three parts, and when the child answers the question, they'll come and give them the bread, and the child will take the bread and hold it like they've got something very valuable. It's very heart-rending. Uh, and then they will fold their hands before you give it to them, and they'll say, Okon, which means thank you. Or they may say, Okon, trying, which means thank you very much. And they're just so humble, and it's so uplifting to see them have such a, a beautiful attitude. And many of the children get one meal a day. Uh, the, the big camp that we have is way out in the province, they say, out in the rice paddies. And many of those children are very poor. Uh, the, some of the clothing that they wear, uh, you can tell that they really look forward to getting a camp T-shirt or a camp ball cap. We tried, we've tried. we gotten to where that big camp, we can't afford to get T-shirts anymore. We've got, we started with 79, now we have 350 to 450. And I believe we could have more than that. It, this year, we at the last day, we had over 1,100 present. Uh, people, the parents were invited to come in. And uh, in the past, we would go and buy some chicken at the Lucky Burger. Although I don't know how lucky the burgers really are to be at that place. And I know I've never eaten a burger at that place. But I know what a chicken wing is, so I, I'd eat a chicken wing there. But uh, we are not able to do that anymore. We can't afford it. We'll go and we'll get our chickens ourselves and they'll deep fry them there on, on the property and give everybody a piece of chicken. And I believe it was seven uh, commune chiefs from the various towns, that's kind of like mayors, they came in and they were very appreciative of the work that we're doing because we try to help their children. And y'all are involved in that. Thank you so much. Uh, over there, a couple of things you need to know in Cambodia, uh, I am a rock star in Cambodia. Uh, I play the guitar for Skit Night. You know, where we're doing silly songs, and I do, you get a line, I'll get a pole, we'll go down to the crawdad hole. And they don't understand the words. But, I, you know, I can really get into that because I've been singing it for like 60, well, I, I, yeah, for my time I was four, yeah, about 60 years. And uh, I was singing it, and one of the children asked my translator, does, 
does Brother John travel the U.S. and do concerts in various cities with his guitar? So just keep that in mind. And, of course, I'm also very appreciated by the ladies over there. I've lost about 50 pounds, so not quite as appreciated as it was. But when I had my belly out here, two of the spider sales ladies, you know, they sold the big black spiders that you put in the deep frying oil, and then you bring them out, and they look like a pretzel, sort of. And they, they eat them, and I told my buddy over there, Brother Chew, I said, next time we pass, I want to get a picture of some of that. And he said, oh, I love those spiders. I said, I'll buy you one if you let me take a picture of you. So I've got a picture of him with the spider crawling, one live one crawling up his arm, and he's eating the other one. And the two spider ladies, I guess they were 40-ish, you know, more on the ish side probably. But uh, they're sitting there, and they look at me, and they see that belly. And see, they think that you must be something special if you're big. So they said, ooh, how you'll get so big? <laughs> and my buddy John Watts uh, said, always tells people, they looked at you and said, ooh, you fat like Buddha, how you get so big? But they did not say that fat like Buddha thing. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I said beef, and they said, ooh, what beef? And I said gull, which is cow there. And uh, they said, oh, gull. Now, of course, they smiled at me. One of them had about two teeth pointing up, one pointing down, Ser seriously. And uh, so they were lovely gals. But uh, I'm uh, very appreciated for my handsomeness over there. So, you know, I, you know, I, so I just want you all to know, if you all don't appreciate me like you should, I, there is a place I can go and be appreciated for my skills. But uh, anyway, the blessing there is to see people obey the gospel. Uh, last year, we had a young lady who had come to camp every year. This is the way it happens. She comes to camp every year. She was, I'd say, I can't tell. There was a little girl about this big and I her teeth were missing in the front I thought oh man she was injured because she's I thought she's three maybe four and I, I said how did you lose your teeth and the translator talked to her and she said they came out because she was seven or eight I mean there was time for them to come out <laughs> but I, I couldn't tell so I can't really tell I, I would guess though that this girl was uh probably eight or nine when she started coming to camp and when she was set, always had this beautiful smile on her face, loved camp, just like our kids love camp around here. They get to going every year. They want to go back the next year. And last year, she came down the aisle, same big smile on her face. And it's a little different. Uh, after all the sermon's over and the song's over, then the preacher will say, is there anyone that wants to be baptized or wants prayer? And she was one of the ones that said that she did. And it was a wonderful thing. She came up out of that water. They have the water that runs off the roof into the big drum, a big, looks like a big pot, lid about this big, and it's rounded on the side like, like a big vase, and uh, the water runs off the roof, and they use it to drink, and to baptize, and to bathe, and that's why we take bottled water. And uh, they'll swish the bugs off the top and drink the water, and my friend there told me, Brother Sophia, he said, oh, this is the best water of all. It's God's water. It comes down from the sky. And I'm thinking, yeah, and it hits that roof where the bird droppings are and runs off the roof down in the barrel. <laughs> but, you know, water is better than uh, any kind of water, I guess, better than no water. But uh, anyway, she was baptized in that big barrel, just pushed her head straight under, and she came up, had the most beautiful little smile on her face and her beautiful, wet, black, straight hair. Uh, and it, it was just a beautiful thing to see. And uh, that's, that's really what it's all about. You know, I've got a bunch of whatnots back there. I've got the little ball that the people make out of the plastic bags. The little boys take old plastic bags, and they keep wrapping them and wrapping them like some of us used to do. Some of us old guys used to do rubber bands that way to make us a little rubber ball. Uh, and uh, that's back there. That's kind of neat. Some of the carvings from Africa, all that's neat. I've got some tanzanite back there. By the way, that's not samples. I'm going to tell you all that's, that's my, my, I try to buy a little piece of Tanzanite every year. It's my investment plan. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's back there. Take a look at it. I've got some rare green and some purple back there. Uh, but I really appreciated what my friend, Brother Chus, I mean, Brother uh, uh, Martin said, Brother Ellie Martin. Last, last year, I think I bought a little piece of stone, a little purple stone. He said, I said, look, look, Brother Ellie, a very deeply spiritual man, gospel preacher, furniture builder, Terry, uh, and also has a son in college like I do, and he has a daughter at home like I do, and, you know, and his wife is thrilled about his work, and my wife is as well. I said, look how pretty this is. Now, he's from there. And he said, I know, Brother John, them some pretty rocks. And I thought, that's right. 
All those little things are just whatnots. Oh, if you like the walking sticks, I collect walking sticks. Look how pretty those walking sticks are back there. Uh, the straight, the real straight one is the one the Maasai tribesmen use. You can get it for about three or four bucks. Uh, the other ones are made for Americans, but I bought them because of the carving. And they were not very expensive over there either. Over here, they're worth about three or four times as much. But I want you especially to look at the, at the pictures. Look at the eyes and the faces of the children. The, you know, this, this is what really counts, is the, is the people and the faces. And you'll find some back there where, you, where one, of the, one of the chubby preachers uh, in, in Africa is baptizing someone or helping someone out of the baptistry. And, and, you know, that's the most important thing. That's really what we're there for, isn't it? And so don't forget to look at the faces. The, the little slide you're looking at there is the orphanage. And uh, it's all boys. And uh, uh, we'll go through this right quick, and then I'll, we'll get on to these verses, okay? Now, there I am with Kraft. Brother John Watts, right before this picture, was doing medical uh, help. He's an LPN. Uh, this is Brother Chu and his family. They're a little bit older. That picture's a little older. They're a wonderful, wonderful family. Uh, this is the camp in, uh, in Simrip. And this is the camp over in uh, Tanzania. Uh, this year we had 100, 220 there and had 27 baptisms. Wow, it was, it was just great. Uh, I would like for you to have been there. We have individual classes, and some of us Americans teach some of the classes, and some of their locals do. Uh, actually, that camp's getting close to the point that uh, we're able to let them do it. In fact, we may be letting them do part of it this year uh, by themselves because we're going to start a new camp across the country in a place called uh, uh, Mbea and, uh, in the Rift Valley. Some of you have probably seen that on the, on the uh, uh, National Geographic Channel. And this was back, uh, this is uh, well, the group from uh, Kosongo. Uh, this is a group from Dar. That particular year we had 302, I believe it was, at camp. I got that picture because I love to see these children uh, reading their Bibles, and it had the little American missionary's daughter, or I think that was a college girl. It didn't look like it, but a little college girl, and right beside her was one of the little local children. And uh, I thought that picture was neat because of those briars there. I thought, big old briars, long briars, and I thought Jesus took the briars so we could go to the baptistry and be baptized and have our sins washed away. Yeah, there are a lot of things there that we can look at, but the most important thing is the study of God's Word. This is the first uh, person that my son, John Tyler, ever converted. We were in Guyana, and uh, we had studied, and we worked with camp. We had some good studies going, but nobody had been baptized yet. And uh, on the last night, uh, the last sermon was over, and we were standing around there, and John Tyler came up very quietly to me and said that this young man wanted to be baptized, and it was his buddy that week. And uh, so I got a picture of them studying their Bible together, and he was baptized. And by the next year, this young man was already in a preacher training school. So sometimes you think, well, we only had one baptism, but you never know where that's going to go. What's our job? Th this great commission that we have, I'll let that keep playing, but let let's talk just a little bit. What is, what is our job in the church? Sir? Spread the gospel. Our job is to teach, uh, and uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more after a while in the, in the pulpit time, but in uh, Luke chapter 8, a sower went out to sow. What's the sower's job? To sow? Yeah. To what? Spread the seed. Uh, and I'm afraid too often, if we don't see uh, results immediately, we have trouble. And that's why I think the, the, the Great Commission is seen in Matthew chapter 28, 18, 19, 20 is so important because we're impatient. You know, I, I, do you ever get upset that you, you uh, push the button on your remote control and there's a little delay there? Does that bother you? I said, when I was a kid, you pushed the button, something happened. You know, these fluorescent light bulbs now, you push the button, it takes a second for it to come on. You can be fell down the steps by then. What is it, half a second or maybe a second? We're impatient people, aren't we? We, we, want, to, we want to turn the air conditioner on at work. Right then. <laughs> Don't you hate those buttons on the, on the windows? When you push the button, the, the window, you want it to come down that far, but you take your thumb off and it keeps going. It thinks it knows what you want. You have to push it twice or something. I'm thinking, 
what happened to the day you push a button, something happened, you take your finger off, it quits. I, I like those old days. We're, we are impatient people. We're like the man who prayed for patience and said, Lord, please give it to me now because I need it bad. And, uh, but that's the way we are when it comes to, to the mission of the Lord. Well, let's break that verse down just a little bit. I, I'm pretty sure I did this. Uh, maybe, I don't know if I've done this here or not, but we, we need to look at this verse very carefully. Did the Lord know that it was going to be difficult for us to grasp the thought that we need to go into all the world and teach the gospel? I think He did. I think He knew that it was going to be a, a tough, tough thing for us to grasp, to think that we could do that. So what does verse 18 say? Chapter 28, verse 18. All all power, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Well, how much power is that? That'd be all. Uh, God, Jesus here, God is fixing to tell us something that's going to be difficult for us to uh, maybe even fathom that we can do. Because you see, here's the problem. Uh, this great commission thing about going in all the world, well, you know, Laney can't do that. You know, she's, she's just 15. Well, she'll be 15 next week. We'll get into the pyramid. Pray for me, okay? But anyway, uh, uh, but anyway, she can't go. She can't drive. Uh, you know, uh, 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 somebody that's 18, they, they, they're not going through college yet. They're not educated enough. And then when they get through college, they got to get a job. They can't go into all the world. And you, know, you just can't. And then you, you, you get married and you, you just got married. You know, I find a wife and must go prove her. Oh, wait a minute. I think that was the ox, wasn't it? But, you know, the ox you had to go prove. But anyway, <clears throat> you find your wife, you find your husband, and, and you, you, don't have, uh, you don't have time right now. I mean, it's just busy time. And how can you think about going into all the world? You're just trying to rent a house or buy a house or buy a piece of land to build a house someday. And, and then you have a couple of kids, and, man, they drive you crazy. And, of course, that once, once you raise them, that's done. Isn't, it? Isn't that right, honey? <laughs> well, we have, is it, when Jordy's baby's born, it'll be 17, 17 grandchildren. Again, pray for us. They're all 11 and under. Yeah, yeah. This will be our fifth girl. The rest of them are boys. When they run, I mean, outside. It sounds, you know, it sounds like a bunch of buffaloes running through. In fact, Denise has a picture where she says, look out, world. It just shows the back of the boys running. About seven or eight of them running off. <laughs> look out, world. But the truth is, we're just too busy now, you know, because we're, we're trying to get our kids in college. We're trying to get our kids graduated. We're trying to get our kids, uh, grandkids started. And we just don't have time. It's really easy to get to the point that you think you don't have time. But this verse says, I want you to know I've got the power. The power that God is going to give us to do what He's about to tell us to do is within Him. And if we will say, okay, Lord, I will do my best to do what you say. He told us to go into all the world. He told us to preach. He told us to teach. He told us to baptize. He told us to teach again. And then what did He say in the very last part of that last verse? 18, 19, 20, verse 20. If we do these things, what's He going to do? Lo... I am with you always, even to the end of the age or end of the world, into this period of time. I'll be with you. So, if, you know, when you sandwich something in, uh, the Lord often did this. It, it, uh, I think you find this with, in the Old Testament. Uh, if you go to Psalms where David was so discouraged about the things that were going on, he said, Lord, how long is this going to happen? How long am I going to be forsaken? How long am I going to happen? Then, and then he would start with a little praise. Then he would talk about his problem. Then he would say, but I trusted in you. Over and over the chapters say that. You know, we do have troubles, and we do have discouragements, and we do get sick. We have to do what we can where we are to evangelize. You know? And I'm afraid today there are too many preachers that are trying to self-excuse themselves out of this. They're saying, we can't do this anymore. Um, it's sad to me, a preacher friend of mine told me he went to a congregation where they were going to have a gospel meeting. Don't, don't let this happen here. So, you know, I, I know I'm the missionary guy. I'm supposed to come in and be all uplifting, and, and, and I'm not supposed to get on to anybody. You know who I get on to when I preach, first of all? A preacher has a unique responsibility. He must preach, first of all, to himself very fervently. Very fervently. Terry would tell you, many times, 
I, I remember years ago I preached a sermon, Condescend to those of low estate. Then it was just a mediocre sermon. It didn't go over too big. But that sermon has helped me for now over 30 years. It echoes in my head. I needed it. You know, yes, I am enthusiastic. You want to ask me? I'm enthusiastic. Somebody said, I went to one congregation made an announcement. This is where uh, Jesse is. One of the elders came up to me and said, we need to get you to preach here. You sound all excited about this work. I said, you mean about carrying the gospel to the world? Yes, sir, I'm really excited about that. <laughs> and I am enthusiastic and excited, but we don't, need to, we don't need to think we're great. What we need to do is realize who we are. Getting sick will make you feel that way, won't it, Terry? It'll let you know who you are, won't it? But you know, we've got to do what we are. And I don't want to embarrass Terry, but... I thought the last time I was going to see Terry was when we came into that uh, ICU unit, and they were gracious. Normally, they only let two people in there, and I think they knew something was up, too. And there were, I think, five or six of us back there. You know what Terry was doing? Terry, I wish I'd have written all the verses down. He was quoting verses, quoting verses. On so much pain medication, uh, you know, but he was still, the last thing he was doing was quoting verses from God's Word. And then at the end, he looked over there, kind of glanced at one little eye. His body was shaking from the pain. And he said, when you get finished with that sermon, I want a copy of it. Send me a copy of it. Listen, he was doing his evangelistic work to what we thought was going to be the end. And that's all God asked. I know life is short. You won't be able to do a whole lot of mission work, just one little lifetime's worth. <laughs> and then the Lord will take whatever it is and make it what it ought to be, right? But a friend of mine was in a, went to a gospel meeting, uh, and he was preaching the gospel meeting, and they didn't have anybody there. Only very few of the members, the, the first service. And this particular preacher said, uh, the, told him, he told the visiting preacher, he said, well, you know, we didn't, he said, well, did y'all door knock? And he said, no, we don't door knock. Door knocking doesn't work anymore. He said, that don't work. He said, well, how about I take you tomorrow and, and, uh, and show you how I do it? Maybe, maybe a different technique. And so they went, and they knocked on the first door, and an old gentleman came to the door, and they greeted him. You know, I have to be careful when I'm preaching this sermon because I don't want to get you the idea that I think the only way to evangelize is door knocking. You know, door knocking is not really personal work. It's organized. It's something that helps you with your personal work because, you know, you can't become personal with somebody till you meet them, right? Like the people at the little uh, uh, place where we stopped to eat, where I went in to eat uh, this morning, got to talking to them. They're from Kentucky, where my 25 miles from where my brother's wife lives. We got to talking a little bit. And you think I'm going to invite those people to worship at the Church of Christ? Yes, I am. And I did. And in fact, I offered them one free pass by the collection plate if they attended the first time. You know, you got to get personal with people. I realize that. I realize door knocking is not that. But and I realize some people handle door knocking wrong in the past. You know, they'd knock, knock on the door, and they're peering through the screen, you know. You know, bug eyed, you know. I realize that. Or when they come to the door, did you know you could die and go to hell tonight? You know, when you're, you know, I realize that some people handled it wrong. But just because somebody handled something wrong, if I might add here a little bit for the in defense of the, uh, us keeping our guns, uh, uh, just because somebody used a gun wrong, does not mean that all guns should be outlawed. Just because somebody used a butter knife to uh, stab somebody with don't mean we can't use a butter knife to put our butter on our toast anymore. <laughs> you know, and just because somebody has done it wrong on door knocking doesn't mean that we should stop door knocking. And, uh, but anyway, they went to the first door and the old gentleman came to the door and he said, he said, well, I'd love to come uh, to hear y'all teach. He said, we're, we're not, I'm trying to help people in the community. We're with the Church of Christ, and we, we help people. And he said, well, thank you. He said, I, we have Bible study if you want to have one. The man said, I'd love to, but we just can't get out. My wife's so sick. And he said, we'll come to your house if you want us to. A house and study the Bible with me? Said the old man, tear rolled down this cheek. And they set up a Bible study with him. The third door, that was the first door. The third door, a guy came to the door, and I'm going to have to ask my buddy if this really happened because you know how us preachers get to telling something and we, some way we see the picture in our mind. I, I don't know if this is it, but if I remember right, he said he had a beer bottle stuck on his finger. I believe that's right. 
It sounds better with it anyway. But he said he came to the door and he had metal rings in his eyebrow and his lip and tattoos all over him. And he said, he said, uh, yeah, what can we do for him? He said he can hear the kids screaming in the background and the wife screaming at the kids. And, and uh, he said, we're here knocking doors, letting people know we're the church of Christ and we help people. And he said, you know, we'll set up a Bible study if you want to. And the man said, just a minute. Hey, honey. He called his wife to the door. She did, was not modestly apparel, and she had metal in her lips and, and tattoos on as well. He said, do you remember last night when we was talking about how we needed to quit smoking marijuana and drinking? Because our kids are a bad influence on our kids. She said, yeah. He said, here these men come today and have, want to have a Bible study with us. Now, here's the sad part. As they're walking away, you know what that preacher that didn't believe that door knocking would ever help? You know what he said? He said, there's nothing going to come with that. You know that. Do, do we not believe that the Word of God is a powerful sword? A quick and powerful sword. If we don't believe it, then, then well, you know, we're not going to be excited about it. If, if, you know, hey, I brought my tonight back there if you look at it. And some of you ladies that like little shiny things, sparkly things, are going to say, oh, now what is this, John? What, what, what color? What color? Why is it? You know, I'm, I'm kind of like that. I, I'm an old guy that used to be a pulp wooder and a, a logger and, and a cabinet builder, but, uh, but I like to look at shiny things. <laughs> I'm, I'm a country boy. But the truth is, uh, if you're excited about something, you know, some of you guys are saying, I'm here today because I love the Lord. I'm not going to go bass fishing or whatever kind of fishing they're doing around here. You know, I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to be here because you're more excited about the Lord than you are fishing. But if you're excited about fishing, you're going to talk about it. You're going to think about it, and you're going to show your new rod and reel and talk about it, and get your new bass boat, and you want it with glitter in it too, don't you? So what we've got to do is we've got to remember to be excited about what the Lord has to say. It's sad to me. After preaching this sermon... Uh, at one congregation, one of the very active ladies of the congregation, she and her husband are close friends of mine. She told me, said, well, John, I don't know about this door knocking, though. She said, we knock doors, and we knock doors, and we knock doors, and we never had a single person come, not even one. And I said, I just came to me all of a sudden. I said, are all of them dead? See, because you plant seed, right? Luke chapter 8, you plant the seed. And the seed falls, some of the seed falls. Do you remember the parable? What? Tell me the kind of soil that sometimes the seed falls on. What now? The wayside, uh, where it hasn't been plowed, where it's been packed down, where the trail is. Sometimes the seed falls on what? But what? Thorns. And they, get, they choke the, the, the plant that you plant. Sometimes, anybody remember another one? Rocks. Plant can come up. Maybe it's... Now, I've noticed this year, I don't know if any of you have a lot of pine trees are dying. And the reason they're dying is because those particular trees most likely are, are on bedrock. Maybe the dirt's about this deep, and it's been a drought. Maybe the dirt's this deep. But, you know, they're supposed to have a tap root as long as they are tall. And they hit that rock, and they can't get around, and they, and they, and they die. And it uh, gives the squirrels a place to live, I guess. But uh, the truth is... Uh, sometimes soil is that way. And uh, uh, so there's all different kinds of soil, all different kinds. But there's one other that's really important that I want to talk about. The good soil. Listen, there's good soil out there. And I want to tell you something. We as members of the Church of Christ must do this. If you're visiting, they want to tell you what the Church of Christ, true members of the Church of Christ believe. We believe that there is a God. Amen? We believe that that God wrote the Bible, gave it to us, right? Amen? God gave us the Bible. Therefore, we believe you ought to do what it says. Amen? And, and you know, if we're studying along and we find something that we've left out, we find a verse that, or, or a section of verses and we think, you know, I haven't been doing that. I, you know, I'm, I've been mistaken. What do we do? Repent, which means change. If we've left something out, we add it. If we've not done something or done something we shouldn't do, we stop doing it. That's why there are things in the Church of Christ, if you're visiting, you think, I wonder why they don't do this or, or don't do that or do this. 
It's because we believe we've found it in God's Word, and we have a scripture to back it up. And if it's not in here, we don't we change. Uh, somebody says, "Well, yeah, but I, you know, we at the Church of Christ, we don't have to change because we got it down pat." Does anybody in here think that if I live another ten years, I won't find something that I was a little bit off on, at least a little bit off? Many years ago, I preached a sermon entitled, From Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord said, Be ye not anxious for the morrow. You ever heard that verse? What does anxious mean? Uh, it means worry. Would that be a good word? I'm sorry, what was the word? Listen, I'm a little bit deaf. Y'all have to talk up. Uh, I don't know why I'm, I'm more deaf in this ear, but every time I'll turn this ear, uh, you know, try to hear, I think I ought to be turning my good ear at least, you know. I went by and uh, checked on getting some hearing aids, and the lady said that it'll be forty five hundred dollars. The insurance doesn't doesn't cover it. And I said, eh. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so it, it means worry. And if the, the Lord said, "Don't worry," so if God told you not to do something, and you do it, you'd think that was a sin, right? Yeah. And that's what I preached. The title of my sermon was "It Is a Sin to Worry." I was a young preacher. And then it was one of the worst top ten sermons I've ever preached. I worried about it for months. Seriously. And, you know, I went back and looked at that in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in that Sermon on the Mount and read it again. I thought, I don't think, I, I need to improve this sermon, but I, I, don't, I don't know if God really wants me to feel in so bad about this that it cripples me. And uh, if you read it in its context, it says something else. He says, be not anxious for the morrow, for the morrow will take care of tomorrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, there's enough things to worry about today than to worry about tomorrow. Then he gives a little scenario. He says, have you not noticed the birds of the air? You remember what he said about the birds? He said, what did he say? I take care of them. I feed them. And they're fat little things. I know that red bird that stands in our bathroom window there for years, just chirping, chirping, chirping. And every, you, we made the mistake of putting a bird feeder out there one time, and every year he'd come back and run up into the window. You know, a fat little bird. And he, he wasn't getting any seed from us toward the end, but, but uh, he was always fat. God takes care of those things. Then he talks about the lilies of the field. Uh, he said they don't spin. Uh, they don't sew. But yet, God clothes them in some of the most beautiful clothing. Then he gives the example of, he said if a, if a son asks his father for bread, he's not going to give him a what? A stone. He's not going to give him a stone. So he said, I, I love you more than all that. So then it hit me what the verse was saying. The verse was saying like this. If a father's walking along with his little three-year-old girl, and it's dark, he's holding her hand, and she says, Daddy, I'm scared. You know? And he says, Don't be afraid, honey. Daddy's right here. Now, what if she says, But I'm still scared? What does daddy do? You, you mean he don't break a little limb off of a little bush and say, Didn't I just tell you not to be scared? Didn't I just tell you, and I'm going to spank you because you didn't do what I told you to do? Well, see, I, I was just mistaken on the... I didn't look at the full context of the verse. And we've got to do that. Now, I, I will tell you this. Worry can sure lead to sin. We can worry to the point that we do things that are wrong. And that's why it's, it is always a shame to worry. Because worry just doesn't get anything done, does it? I used to tell my children, they'd say, Oh, now at camp all the time, I've lost my bar of soap. I think somebody stole it. And I said, well, honey, I don't think anybody would steal your bar soap. Yeah, but it was, the, it was the perfumed kind. And usually later in the day, they'd come back, I found my soap, it was in my suitcase. Well, what a strange place to put it. You know? But I always tell them this, well, listen, don't worry. Two reasons. Number one, if it's gone forever, you're never going to see it again. You might as well get used to it. <laughs> right? You'll never have fun again. I used to tell my kids, you'll never have, even Christmas, you won't have any fun when you open your Christmas present. Yeah, I will. But also, if you find it, you will have worried for no reason at all. And you're probably going to find it when you're looking for something else you lost anyway. Right? But that, Now, I didn't read that verse and say, well, hey, I've already got a sermon written up on this about how it's a sin to worry, and I'm not changing my sermon. 
We as members of the church of Christ believe you study to show yourself approved unto God, the workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we do that every day. Uh, what time are we supposed to stop here? 15 to? Oh, I've got one minute. All right. I think I can sum up the last 30 minutes of this thing. We're just getting into the Scripture. But we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God a work, and then He's not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of the truth. Now, therefore, we have to evaluate what the Bible says. And a lot of people evaluate the Bible this way. Well, I know it says that, but, uh, you know, hey, I've never believed that, and, uh, you know, that's my family's... What does this mean? Somebody tell me what that means. You tell your daughter to do that when she sees a boy, right? What do, you, what do you do? What does that mean? Get away from me. And now the girls need to do that when the guys get you know, Hey, but you don't need to ever do that to the Word of God. But we, but people do that. I mean, they literally put their hand up. And uh, thank you for listening. We're going we're gonna to dive right back into this. Uh, in the pulpit time in a few minutes. But, but let me say this. God has given us a great commission. It's a great commission because of its scope and, and because of, of what it's all about. We're reaching out to the lost. We're trying to help people go to heaven. And, and somebody told me the other day, they said, well, if you're sitting Brother John on the airplane, he's going to have a Bible study with the person sitting next to him. Why not? I mean, really, you're sitting on the airplane for 13 hours going to Cambodia? From Atlanta to, to, uh, to uh, Seoul, Korea? And you're going to sit there and you're going to talk about their kids. They're going to show you their pictures. They're going to talk about this and that. And you're not going to talk to them about the Lord. See, I don't understand that. It's just a natural thing for us to talk about our grandchildren. And it's a natural thing for us to talk even more so about our Lord. So this great commission, uh, uh, we need to carry it out. We'll talk a little bit about some methods, hopefully, to do that in the pulpit time in just a little bit. Thank you.